Well, good morning. For those of you that don't know, I'm not Pastor Chris. I'm the youth pastor here. Pastor Chris is off to a family retreat, and uh, they get a couple days with other pastors and their families, and they're going to just enjoy a little time of being a family. So I will be here today, and I hope that you enjoy what I've got to say. Um, I was just getting ready to come up here, and Carter is my youngest son, and I was feeling a little distracted, and he says to me, uh, not, he didn't even know it, he goes, Dad, get your head in the game. <laughs> I'm, I must have said that to him at one point, baseball or mowing the lawn or raking Lee, whatever it was, but he said, so I got to get my head in the game. So uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, this has been an amazing week at this church. I don't know if you know that. Um, we saw some of the kids up here, but this place was alive. You could walk in the door in the morning and you could feel the energy. And it's that way every year. This VBS is an amazing program that we have here at this church. And it's run by two wonderful women and in a ton of volunteers. So if you were unfortunate and were busy or you just couldn't get your grandkid here or your kid here, you need to get them here next year. This is an amazing program. I was talking to one of the volunteers that was lead, he was a crew leader and uh, he was just talking to me a little bit about it. And he had a kid in his, in his crew. His name was Jeremiah. And Jeremiah came to our, he doesn't attend our church, but he was in his uh, group. And Jeremiah was not only in this group, but he w went to another VBS at another church. And then he went to a Wednesday night program and all of these other things. And I'm going to brag on this program a little bit, but he came back to this volunteer the next day and he asked him, so how was it, Jeremiah? How was your other VBS and how was the Wednesday night Oh, this one is so much more fun, he said. So we have a pretty good thing here, but it's backed by an incredible number of people and volunteers that have a heart for children. And this church has a heart for children. So what I want to talk to you a little bit about today is youth ministry. It's kind of along that same line, but I'm going to just kind of take a moment and talk about youth ministry, what attracts people to it, and why does it matter to you, right? I see a lot of you know, I'm not going to call anyone out. A lot of gray hair and some shiny heads. So why does it matter to you? Who cares about youth ministry, right? Well, I was, I was messing around here. And uh, did you know in America, there are six generations alive in America right now? Do you know that? I was just putzing around. In fact, it's on my cell phone here. It's not even in my notes. There's six living generations. Have you ever heard of the GI generation? This is one I never heard of. The GI generation, they were born from 1901 to 1926. Of course, they have some wonderful, endearing qualities. They're assertive, energetic, they're doers, they accept team, they're excellent team players, they're community-minded. Uh, the D word was never used, the divorce. They never divorced. So that was just something they didn't do. They avoided debt, paid everything in cash. There's another group I had never heard of. Mature Silence. Born 1927 to 45, they served in Korea, Vietnam, World War II. They, uh, they're the richest, the most free-spending retirees in history. They actually accumulated enough wealth in their lifetime where they could actually retire. I think we've all heard of this generation, baby boomers. We've got a pile of them in here. Every church has got a pile of them. It's the largest, the largest generation in the nation. Um, first generation to have TV. Maybe not when they were born, but the first generation to have TV. Over 77 million people are in this generation. Gen X. I'm a Gen Xer. Gen X thinks that they're all on their own. There's nobody understands them. <laughs> they, uh, they desire a chance to learn. Uh, AIDS was the first lethal disease that wasn't quarantined, and it happened under the Gen X uh, lifetime. Their school problems were drugs. It's when it became, problems became, they were more difficult and more difficult. Gen X really started to see that. There's Gen Y, millenniums. Have you ever heard of millenniums mentioned? Born 1981 to 2000. They, uh, the Gen, the millennials and the Gen Zs, which I'll tell you about. I was talking to my brother. I'll tell you a little bit about this, this group. Um, He's a college professor in Ohio, and he's got kids that are coming in now. Now get this, this is going to be weird, because I remember getting a microwave, 
I remember getting a VCR that we owned and we weren't renting from the store. These kids coming into college now don't know life without a cell phone. What? Are you kidding me? If you don't feel old, you're going to start to feel old really quick. They don't know life without a cell phone. I still think this is a strange thing. And there's kids that don't know life without it. So, of course, they don't know what a VHS tape is. In fact, I was watching this one video about this. They took these cell phones and gave these kids a cell phone, a cassette tape, some 8-track tapes and all this stuff, and a, and a stereo in the room. Do you know what a lot of kids did with the cassette tape thing that we used to have in our car? They put their phone in it. It was a, it was a place where their phone wouldn't slip out when they're driving around. That's what they did with it. They asked them to do things with them, and they, they decided that was a slap for the phone. That's a good storage spot for the phone. But <laughs> so Generation Z. I've got some millennials, not very many, some of the older kids, but I've got a ton of Generation Z. That's where they are. They're teens. That's where my passion is. The teenagers today, they're being pulled in a million different directions. We all had our own challenges. Every generation has their own challenge. But the teens of today, here, here's an example. Grandparents, drive down to the cities or go over to the house and decide you're going to take the grandkids for three days. Just unannounced, grab them and go. Would that work? It might work on a rare occasion, but can you say major crisis? Holy cow, if you were to take the kids away for a weekend, a day, their schedules are so packed. They don't have time to think. The kids today, they have to have these cell phones with calendars just to keep their life straight. We're talking young kids. These kids are twitchy. These are quotes. Now, I'm not making this. These are, these are quotes from adults. They're twitchy. They're loud. They're annoying. They mess stuff up. They're always looking for free food. They're being loud at the wrong time. They're moody. They're difficult, self-centered. They don't shower enough. And when they do shower, this is the funniest thing I ever heard of an old grandma tell me. When they do shower, they smell like the fragrance counter at her burgers. And they do. Boy, when a boy decides to finally shower, that axe is on from head to toe. They suffer from bad self-esteem. Autism, Tourette's, divorced parents, abuse, broken homes, dysfunctional homes, ADD, ADHD, alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome, eating disorders, cutting, suicide, suicidal thoughts. They are being pulled in a million different directions. And it's manifesting itself in these disorders, some of them. I decided this morning, last minute, to look this statistic up, and it was shocking. There's one group that kills themselves more than teenagers, and it's our veterans that come back from war. What have they seen in war? 22 soldiers a day commit suicide. 15 to 20 teenagers a day commit suicide. What are they seeing? What is happening to our youth where they are second only to men and women who have fought in a war and seen the horrors of war? PTSD. What are they seeing? What are they hearing? What is going on? Well, this same group, I love them to death. They're our world. Tanya and I have said more than once that the youth group of this church complete our family. And they do. We built a house that was way too big because we had plans to fill it. We went through an adoption process in China. and We were several thousand dollars into it and China decided they were done adopting. And we were kicked out of the program, basically. So we thought, what are we going to do? Well, this opportunity came up. <laughs> I just saw myself, why? What about me? I, this opportunity came up. I was on the C board. I was voted C board chair just because I missed a meeting. So that's how it works when you're on C board. But I was, I was elected C board chair, and I'm glad I was because what happened at the time is we had lost our youth, youth pastor. He had stepped down. And we're coming into late summer here, and we don't have a replacement. So we're kind of, you know, kind of behind the eight ball pretty bad. So. It was decided at that time that the CE board would take shifts and we would start working 
as the youth pastor just so that these teens had somebody that would talk to them and kind of mentor them for a bit. Well, as the CE chair, I decided I should probably, you know, put, my, put the money where my mouth is, and I decided to take the first shift. And, uh, well, that shift's still going on. I haven't, I haven't stopped. I was elected to be the youth pastor, and, and it's, been wonder- it's been an incredible ride. I love it. Love it to death. So what, what attracts us to youth ministry? I was kind of forced into it unknowingly, but I then volunteered to stay there. So what is it that, for, that people see? What is the attraction to youth ministry? Here's some numbers I'm going to give you, and I don't like doing numbers very much, and I, I almost didn't do it, but I'm going to have you guys help me with these numbers, okay? So I'm going to do something nobody likes to do. I'm going to have everybody stand up. Everybody, hey, you know what? Let's make it fun. This church loves to greet. So while you're standing, why don't you say hi to the people next to you? Huh? There, we've compromised. So you guys are good at that. We love greeting, don't we? We love potlucks almost as much. Two things we love the most, greeting and doing that little thing, potlucks. So what, what is it that drives sane people to be a youth minister? It's insanity. No. Here's what it is, and I'm going to show you what it is. I'm going to ask you when you accepted Christ, and if you haven't, just, just sit at any point. I don't want anybody to feel weird or awkward, but I just want to show you some numbers here. If you accepted Christ in your 80s, sit down. In your 70s, you were 70 years of age, sit down. In your 60s, sit down. Do you see what's happening? Nobody sat down for those of you in the front, by the way. In your 50s, sit down. In your 40s, sit down. This is going really, really well. I had no idea how this was going to work out. By the way, where was I? In your 40s. In your 30s, okay, we got some now going down. In your 20s, I would sit at this point. Okay, look at this. This is why I do it. Right here, 99% of you, 90% of you for sure are still standing. This is why. All right, let's all sit. That's what attracts people to youth ministry. That's why it's so incredibly important. Of course, I think so. I know most of this church thinks so. I want everyone to think so. 85% of people, this is a statistic across the United States, trust Jesus before the age of 18. The average teen has 150 friends that they meet on a face-to-face basis. Now, we have to use that statistic now, face-to-face, because there are social media There are social friends. I looked at some of the kids' Facebook accounts that I'm friends with. The numbers are staggering. I'm going into it thinking, I actually, when I first started thinking about it, I'm thinking, okay, probably 150, 200 friends on Facebook. No. Males. Males. 700 Facebook friends. Females. Wager a guess. Who said 1,500? 1,500 on the money. I had one young lady who's here that exceeded that number. It is mind-boggling how many friends these kids have. What does that mean? Big deal. They have a ton of friends. These are kids they can reach with the gospel. These are kids that they have an influence on. In fact, they have a hundred times more influence on those kids than I do or than any of you do. Because we're strangers and we're adults. Until they get to know you, you have no influence on their life. They'll listen to Billy here and Susie. Boy, if they say jump a bridge, we're jumping bridges. Right? Teenagers are always looking for a cause. I've given them some challenges in the past and they always exceed my expectations. Always. 
Teens are smart enough to make a change and they're crazy enough to act on that. Adults would rather discuss outreach than actually do it because our brains have fully developed, unfortunately. <laughs> and I say that in an unfortunate way because we are called to share the gospel and teenagers do it with vigor. Which brings me to scripture. In the Bible, we see references of teens all over the place. And we're going to look at a few of those places today to validate what we're talking about, okay? So we're going to look in Deuteronomy. If you have a Bible, you can pull it out at this time. If you have a smartphone or an iPad or anything, whatever you have, if you have an app in it, go ahead and pull it out. We'll pull it out at this time. We're going to look in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6. 6. <laughs> 6-6. Six, six. Let me get my phone out of the way here. Now, Deuteronomy is Moses talking to the Israelites, okay? And he's sharing with them. It's, it's three sermons, basically, is what I found out. Three sermons that kind of give the Israelites sort of their laws that they're going to follow, okay? He tells them in one part that we're waiting to enter the promised land and here's some of the things we want to do and here's some sanctuary cities, some safe cities that we can, uh, that we can enter, okay? That we can be near. The second part is a long, long section of laws and rules and kind of governing information for the Israelites. But what I want to look at is one little part here in this, in this section. And I'm going to read 6, 6 through 9. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your homes and on your gates. You've got to keep in mind here when I'm reading this that the Israelites are largely nomadic at this time. They've been wandering the desert for a very long time. They're closing in on 40 years now. And through the wanderings, I mean, they would set up camps and stuff, but they're largely nomadic, okay? So when he says, tell them all the rules that I've given you from the moment when you are on the road, when you're going to bed and when you wake up, when you wake up in the morning, when you're on the road, I mean, we're, we're traveling all day. So he's basically, in essence, telling them, don't forget what God has told us. And talk to these kids from the moment we get up while we're moving along the road when we go to bed. All day. Keep telling them what God has done for us. Keep telling them the rules once we enter the promised land. This is reiterated later in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 32, 45. It's recapped there, and it says basically the exact same thing. So it's repeated. Okay? So it's got some importance to it. Deuteronomy, unfortunately, by some people that read the Old Testament, is looked at as a book of old laws that they kind of skim over. I hadn't really read Deuteronomy, I'll admit it, until I prepared for this, so I am guilty of that as well. But Deuteronomy, I didn't know this, was repeated in the New Testament 80 times. Jesus used Deuteronomy when, in Matthew 4, He's being tempted by Satan. When Jesus speaks out against Satan in Matthew, he's repeating Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, it, Jesus reaffirms Deuteronomy in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, And I know you've all heard this. The first and greatest command, love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Jesus is quoting that from the book of Deuteronomy. So this book, and I'm going to try not to say it too many times because I'm going to start to slur it and stumble all over it, but this book has a lot of validity. In fact, it's thought by some theologians that the book of Deuteronomy was used as a seed for the Sermon on the Mount. So there's a lot of validity to this book. So when we read this here, it says to make sure we talk to our children day, night, from the morning we wake up, while we're on the road, when we go to sleep, write it on our doorposts, carry it, there, carry it on our foreheads and on our wrists. There's, there's reminding uh, uh, 
scripture that they would put on their wrists, the Jews would put on their wrists. But unfortunately, the Israelites are a lot like we are. And we don't always do what we're told, and we kind of try to do things on our own will, and, and they messed up. And we find that out later on in the book of Judges. 2.10, it says, After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what the Lord had done for them. So they weren't able to fulfill the promise. And it was, in fact, in Judges, God had to send Judges to bring people that could share the word with them. So they weren't able to fulfill their promise. And unfortunately, if you look at statistics of today, we're not a lot different. That's the beauty, in a weird way, that's the beauty of the Israelites. When we did a, 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 a Bible study a couple years back now called The Story, the one thing that stood out to the youth group and myself was how very similar we are to the Israelites. And we can laugh at their mistakes and we giggle about some of the stuff, the drawings and all this stuff, but we are so much like the Israelites in a good way and in a bad way. Because if you look statistically, and I got these numbers from churchleadership.com and CNN. Only 20% 20 of the population attends church on a regular basis. Church attendance is steadily in the decline. By the year 2040, and I know a lot of you are going, oh good, 2040, I won't be around. We're going to be around. (laughs) Your grandkids are going to be around. By the year 2040, if the decline continues, wait, only ten, less than 10% of the population will attend church. That's a spooky number. Between the years of 20, 2000 and 2004, the net gain of new churches was 5,452. The problem with that number is 3,800 of those, only 3,800 of those survived. In that same time frame, 3,000 churches closed the doors. So we had a net gain of 800 new churches. Do you know what that number should have been? Had the population, staying with population trends, it should have been closer to 13,000 new churches. My friends, we're a lot like the Israelites. And we're facing a time where we've got to make a change. God sees the importance in teens. The teens are used all over the Bible. Joshua, who was second in command of Moses, was a teen. David was a young teen when he slayed Goliath. You know the story. There's an army, an army of professional soldiers. Nobody does anything. 13-year-old boy walks in with a rock and takes out a giant with God's help. Jeremiah started prophesying before he was a teen. He was probably younger than 10. Mary. Mary was betrothed to be married, but not quite married yet, so she was roughly 13 years of age. Jesus saw the importance in teenagers just as much. In fact, Jesus understood the importance of teenagers and he was so confident in the ability of teenagers that he staked all of Christianity on it. Follow me here, please. We're going to go to Matthew 17, 24 through 27. All right? For time's sake, I'm not going to read it to you. But I want you to follow me when I reference these. Okay? So the disciples have arrived into Capernaum and they are just settling down, maybe getting ready to have dinner. And Peter's outside and they ask him, some temple tax collectors ask him, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Peter's like, yeah, yeah, hey, back off. Yeah, we pay it. Well, no problem at all. So there's a funny little part in the scripture. I love the way Jesus always does things. But before Peter says a word, Jesus says to him, what do you think, Peter? 
do, do kings tax their own people, or do they, or do they have, or do the people they have conquered? Jesus knew the conversation that took place outside, so he's quizzing Peter on it right when he walks in the door. What do you think, Peter? What do you think about this tax thing? Peter's like, whoa, you knew that too, huh? So he sends Peter down to the lake or ocean. He says, go fish. You're going to pull a fish out and you're going to pull some coins out of his mouth and that'll pay your taxes for you and I. Follow me to Exodus 31, 14. I want you to save these two pages because if your teenager is ever feeling inadequate, not good enough, too young, not important, not smart enough, not pretty enough. Walk them through this. Because here we see money for the tabernacle. All who have reached their 20th birthday must give this sacred offering to the Lord. 19 and below don't pay it. If we go back to Matthew, Jesus tells Peter, take it and pay the tax for you and I. Peter's the only one that's over 20 or older. Jesus is over 20. He's in his 30s. Everybody else is a teenager. The future of Christianity lied in the hand of teenagers. And it lies in the hands of teenagers today. I get asked this a lot. If I mention, I, like, I also work with fireplaces. So I'll go into a house and a conversation starts up. I love to bring up church whenever I can because it's an opportunity to talk to somebody about the gospel. So it's an easy in for me. Pastor Randy taught me this. Mention you're a pastor. It's an, it's an easy in and they'll just start talking to you. So I mention that I'm a youth pastor and I start talking with them. Oh, you're a teenage adult. <laughs> I've heard that more than once. Or a variation, oh, you're a teenage adult. Yeah, I guess I am. But here's the point. We play games, we play paintball, we play football, we play ultimate frisbee, we play dodgeball, we play pool, we swim off, we swim, we dive off of pontoon boats and dive down as deep as we can. We flip around underwater, open our eyes and see this little green dot that's the sun. That was a game we just played Friday night. <laughs> see who could dive down the deepest and look back up and see the sun that just looks like this little green dot way, way underwater. <laughs> kind of a strange game. Yeah, I play games with them. But it's no different than playing golf with a business associate trying to forge a relationship, is it? It's the exact same thing. We're trying to forge a relationship so that when the moment is right, you can share the gospel with them. And it's coming from a trusted source. So yeah, we play a lot of games. We make a lot of noise. Sometimes they smell funny. They look funny. But if Jesus trusted them, I think we should trust him too. Let's pray.